in 2068. It went viral and like, I was like, whoa, this is crazy. I had this urge to tell stories and then it started to lead into missing people. Gabby Petito never goes outside. I first heard about Gabby Petito on TikTok and then I saw it was on the news. Gabby was still missing and no one knew where she was and then Brian went missing and then that was a whole situation. Where was he? On the ground and in the air. The search for Brian Laundrie, led by the FBI, resumed at this Florida Reserve today. What makes me different than most online sleuths is I like to sleuth at a physical location where things are happening. No media out here. So if we're the only ones out here, media might not care. Or we're we're, we're going to get there. And we're going to just see what the area looks like. Chronicles of Olivia, very nice person. She had a platform way bigger than mine. and. You know, she was very passionate on trying to find answers herself and using her platform. Oh, God. I just almost stepped on something, yeah. This smells right here in this area, badly. Yeah, we got, we were here I don't too. think there's, like, a competition amongst content creators to get that stuff. I think we're all collectively there for the same cause. You see something? Yeah, they're bombs. You found bones? It's a spine. It's a spine. Oh! That's the thing about sleuthing when your boots on the ground, when you're in a physical location. I received a tip last night. A man said that he found a noose on a tree near where Brian's remains were. You get leads, and one lead will lead to another, and it's a domino effect. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I just found something. I just found something. We started looking at all the pictures of Gabby Petito, and lo and behold, it is the same water bottle. We found Gabby Petito's water bottle. We found evidence in the case. Olivia has these spectacular videos, you know, and then I have these, you know, little spurts of information. Oh, we're out here, because I didn't know what the heck I was doing on TikTok. I'm just throwing videos out. Her job or their high school job. So what had happened? And the next thing you know, people are just interested. You know, they were just interested and they just wanted so much information. Bullhorn Betty, what's amazing about her is she has this drive. We want the truth from you. She's spitfire, but in a good way. Shame on you! Shame on you, Laundry family! Shame on you! That's where I got my name, Bullhorn Betty, is because of that. Before that, I was just Andra. She went to school and studied law, so she knows a lot of legal terminology. I say behooved and stuff like that, you know? And I digress, I mean, <laughs> you know? I can only do so much by myself. Olivia's like, I don't even know how she talks, but she talks like this, and she just has a way of talking to those younger kids. So yes, it's definitely beneficial. Huh? Yes, because water fills in your shoes. It was just something about her, and we all just kind of gelled really quickly, and here we are. We collaborate on many cases. You really don't see a lot, a whole lot of Chronicles of Olivia without Bullhorn Betty, and you don't see a whole lot of Bullhorn Betty without Chronicles of Olivia. Olivia, Jonathan, and I kind of picked the front door in of social media and going out and looking into these cases and not taking mainstream media's word for it, police department's word for it, us going out there and finding out the truth. You have a disdain for mainstream media. <laughs> the information that we found out, news stations cannot legally talk about. But because it's just me and my friends, we are unbiased, unfiltered, and we provide raw footage. I have more freedom where I can literally say whatever I want versus when you are working for a corporation. Legally, sometimes there's certain things the reporters can't talk about. You're basing this off of what the reporter told you. It's not something that we can, from a legal standpoint, pull off. But I can talk about it. And that was the beginning. It is believed that between 3 and 4 a.m. on November 13th, the unspeakable happened. Four beautiful souls tragically lost their lives. I decided to search the victims on their social media accounts. And I looked up Kaylee Gonzalez, and I saw that it said, follow back. My heart just dropped. It was an eerie feeling to think that she watched my true crime videos and my stories 
and now her life ended in a crime. That really solidified for me. I have to find out what happened to her. First, my deepest condolences to the families and friends of Ethan, Zena, Kaylee, and Madison. The victims appeared to have been close friends. On the same day they were killed, Kaylee Gonsalves posted this picture showing all four students smiling. One lucky girl to be surrounded by these people every day, she wrote. This case has kind of rocked the world. I have daughters 26 and 30, 26 and 30. This hit home to me right here. They had their whole entire lives ahead of them and I just can't imagine how their families feel. It was extremely chilling because there was no obvious motive, there was no obvious suspect. Doors like the doors of this house were all of a sudden getting locked at night. It seems like everyone that has been here for a while is just devastated by it. Um, the last murder here was 2015, so seven years ago. It was like we were in a big city and we're not a big city. We're just a bunch of provincial rural residents that are almost a bubble. And our bubble got popped. The crime scene law enforcement walked into would have been grisly. The fact that there was blood outside of the house from what had happened on the inside of the house is horrific in itself. And one can only imagine the sheer amount of blood in order for it to drip down an exterior like that spatter all over the walls, all over the ceiling. It would have been gruesome, as gruesome as any scene as anyone's ever seen in a movie. Do you think about it? Do you think about, you know, there's someone out there maybe around here that was capable of doing that? Yeah. yeah. I went to Moscow. I had never been in the area uh, alone with one female producer. I think a lot of us felt like we were not just covering a story, but also figuring out how to stay safe when there is such a gruesome killer on the loose. We both came from a super small town and nothing like this has like ever happened ever. And so coming here and it happened was like a big shock of like, oh my gosh, this stuff actually happens. Like it's not just in the movies or like on the news. Like this is like where we live right now. Today, downtown, volunteers put up flyers on store windows asking anyone who has a home camera, a security camera, to look for anything suspicious the night of the murders. If anyone in our community or across our nation has any information, please call our tip line. From previous cases, I know that you ask for help from public because there might be 10 out of 100 people out there that have something interesting or something that might help you. After that, it's people, anybody that's sitting in their house that locks up to their computer day in and day out, they will throw everything they think out on a tip line. How many tips have come in? Over a thousand. I don't have the number for today, but well over a thousand. Every call that comes in, I know this for a fact, that every call that comes in is investigated. They have to check on any lead. Because if they don't and one turns out to be valid, they're in the soup. But they don't have unlimited resources. I just looked up Moscow PD, and I think they have 37 sworn officers. So they're a small PD. Couple detectives, supervisors, you probably have 20 guys on patrol. That's about it. In a small town like Moscow, Idaho, uh, they just don't have the resources. They don't have the numbers to handle a case like this. Y'all do know that it's not just the Moscow police handling this. Like, they have outside sources. They have neighboring state troopers, FBI agents. Like, it's not just them involved. And so we all sat on it. We all said, well, they'll figure it out. But once the media got here, it turned into almost a circus. There are film crews that are just setting up every single day outside of the house showing up and asking us questions that we didn't have answers to. Police revealed they are working with the two surviving roommates who were home during the attack, but are not considered suspects. So the other two roommates were there at the time of the attack? Yes, they were. How do the other two roommates not hear 
anything. Who knows? Who knows? We were descended upon by every news agency in the world. YouTubers and crime tourists putting a lot of pressure on law enforcement to do something. Who among this tight-knit community could have committed this heinous crime? Who did this crime? Sorry, that is a reminder to bathe my kid. Um, my name is Kathleen Hale and I write about crime and social media. What's different today is that we're able to not only watch crime stories unfold in the news or in books, but on social media, which for the first time makes crime stories interactive. What would you do? Like, I don't know, tell me what you guys think. And I think it's why people are starting to talk about um, true crime in terms of morality and whether it is good or bad. At one point you wanna say, when are we gonna respect the privacy? Oh, but on wow. the other hand, we all wanna know. In the days after the quadruple homicide, students were quite scared and police were very tight-lipped. Why has there been such limited information over the past couple days? Why has it been so limited? Yeah, it's a difficult, um, we have a lot of information coming in. Police seem to be keeping their information really close to the chest that otherwise would be important for a community to feel safe. What they have said from the start is this was a targeted attack. Targeted attack. Targeted attack. Law enforcement did say that they thought this was targeted. 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 And that indeed the community didn't have to worry about anything. Authorities say there is no imminent threat to the community at large. False. It is an imminent threat. And I just got an email from the police department saying that this has been an internal miscommunication between detectives and my office to clarify investigators do not believe the murders were random, but we cannot unequivocally state the residents or any occupants were specifically targeted. Everyone jumped on that because at that point, I think everyone felt misled. It was nerve wracking to hear them say that we are no longer like totally safe. As scary as it is, and I know that they're trying to prevent mass panic, no one is safe right now. And we want to reassure the uh, community that um, the Moscow Police Department and everybody working on this will do everything we can. I think it caused definite mistrust in the social media communities. Trust the police and what they're saying and blah, blah, blah. The mainstream media. Four people were stabbed to death in their home and to not have anyone as a suspect. In the public's view. And we will um, do everything we can to solve this. Thank you. And there was this narrative that emerged that the Moscow police were inept, you know, small town cops in over their head. Listen, they could be great cops, but they just don't have the equipment and the manpower to handle a big case like this. Because there was silence, because there was not, were not any answers, sleuthing really went into overdrive. I'm taking you to the scene of the crime. This was in Moscow, Idaho, which is a small town. So we're going to talk about this Idaho case because I have a lot to say. I am analyzing each of the victims, trying to figure out who did this crime. Social media caught fire. This is Queen Road, OK? This is King Road. And if you zoom right in between that gap of the apartments, there's a stairway that leads. You have the second level, and then you have the third level. And it really started to just take a life of its own. The suspect's likely male. And apparently there was no this bloody trail. There's a report for that all five One in the house at the scene. Random psycho. <sighs> what happened? Everyone will be safe. God bless. A timeline is now emerging showing where all four victims were in the hours before the attacks. <sighs> On the night they died, Kaylee was not meant to be in town. Kaylee was all packed up and ready to go start a new life in Austin, Texas. She had gotten a job, she was graduating, but she had just used her own money to buy herself a Range Rover. She only came home that night to show her new car to her best friend. And while she was there, they decided to go out. They went out to the corner club. They had a great time. They went to a taco truck. Hello. Hi. 
Welcome back. And they took an Uber home. Ethan and Zana went to a party at Sigma Chi. They returned home around the same time as Kaylee and Maddie. And there's reason to believe that in the minutes leading up to her murder that she was scrolling through TikTok, the same platform where all these sleuths would later pontificate on what happened to her that night. Hey YouTube, it's me right now. I am driving to Moscow, Idaho. Um, I'm here with Bullhorn Betty, my friend, me. Hey yo! Do you remember the early days, like what sort of information you got? Yes, I do. I remember this case, I, I review it daily, but yes, I remember. Uh, basically, we had nothing. All that we had at the beginning was the four victims' names and the location of this. We think it's in the general vicinity. Let's look up down there and see if there's any stairs. So we're just it's breaking news, stairs. everyone. Chronicles of Olivia and Bullhorn Betty are outside the crime scene right now. We'll Those two actually gave me that. access to track their movements. Um, there's reason to believe that whoever did this crime is still in that area around that home. You see them moving. Now, if you look down this pathway, you can see right there is the house. I will, um, I'm constant in contact with them. So when they provide me with some updates, I'll share it with you guys. So definitely subscribe to my channel, like hit the notification button, check out my other videos. There's the house. The very first time I went to 1122 King Road and I walked up that hill and I was standing in front of the house, showing people how it looked like during the day and at nighttime in correlation to the frat house and everything is left how it was found. The lights were still on. You could see the neon sign that said good vibes. It's like the house is stuck in time. And when I see the house, I keep imagining in my head that they're still in there. Kaylee and Maddie, between 10 to 1.30 a.m., went to the corner club. After, they went to a food truck called Grub Truck. These 10 minutes of live footage are haunting to watch. This is the last time the girls were seen before they went home and met their fate. Have a good night. Hello. Hi. Welcome back. I think I would like the um the car. Uh, no, okay. You up cool. Thank you. Absolutely. Where'd the pen go, guys? Where's my pen? How are you guys doing? How are you? Extra slot? Is that a charge? No, it's not a charge. It's just a modifier. In the video, the girls are clearly there getting their food. And there is a man there who we now know of as J.S. Many people refer to as Hoodie Guy. Hoodie Guy? Hoodie Guy. Now look at this. Video shows Madison pointing at a man in a hoodie who appeared to have followed them to the truck. He's kind of standing around, looking at the girls. Looks like he tries to interact with them a little bit. When the girls leave, the gentleman in the white hoodie lifts his hand and then walks off. There was recently footage released of what appears to be Kaylee and Madison hours before their murders. And then this is Jack Showalter, AKA Hoodie Guy. People have been trying to figure out what the individual in the hoodie was saying before Maddie and Kaylee speak. They're gonna get you girls, Maddie. I swear to God. I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, one of the top three. Shout out, right? If we're gonna shout out for anything, I guess shout out for that. Like at least we're winning at something. Um, places for murder. 
There's so many people that are murdered and nothing, it doesn't get solved. Okay, so the Moscow police are somehow saying, hey guys, everybody needs to travel in groups. Like, travel in groups, what the f does that do? How many people were in the goddamn house? I don't fit into any niche. Am I a beauty influencer? Am I a lifestyle influencer? Am I a true crime influencer? I, I really don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I do all of it, but that's who I am. I'm a true crime conspiracy theorist. Also, I am a weather conspiracy theorist. And I will fucking track a hurricane before the goddamn news station actually does so. If there's a theory, I'm gonna share it. And I'm gonna put my own little spicy opinion on it. I don't really filter anything. I just kind of say it how I feel. If it's gonna piss you off, scroll on now. You're always gonna find somebody that likes your content. For all my people that have been following me forever and you know what the fuck is up. Love you. When I first found out about the murders, I kind of went down a social media rabbit hole. We're almost into December. They don't even have a murder weapon. We know that the autopsies determined that it was likely all four victims who were asleep during the attack. Some of the victims had defensive wounds, and each victim was stabbed multiple times. There's speculation that one of the four were targeted. Their means of death don't match. The father of Kaylee Gonsalves, one of the four University of Idaho students, has new information. Fatties, they don't end Kaylee's cause of death. It does not match based on the autopsy report. They don't match. Yeah. Kaylee's father said they were found in the same room and in the same bed. Kaylee Gonzalez's injuries were significantly more brutal than her best friend Maddie's. The way Kaylee was found and murdered, she possibly could have been the targeted person. Steve shared with Fox News how he asked the coroner, Kathy, how many times were each of the victims stabbed? In Kathy's disturbing response, she says, Sir, I don't think stabs is the right word. It was like tears, like this was a strong weapon, not a stab. Steve shares, the knife slashed open Kaylee's liver and lungs. You could find out anything on the internet. You could figure out everything. And if not, I'll call my godfather and figure it out. Hey, what's up, my godfather works in intelligence. I go to him for everything. When would you see a case with a knife involved, usually? A lot of times, I'm not, it, it, it exclusions every rule, but a lot of times when we saw knives, it was heat of passion, like with domestic type. The mayor's called it a crime of passion. Is there any indication that that's true? A crime of passion makes us think it has to be somebody close to the victims, not a stranger. So the speculation starts going. When I called my godfather, the very first thing he said was, sounds like a crazy ex-boyfriend, possibly. Regarding the boyfriend, how can we be sure he was properly ruled out? And I understand why people are going after him. Kaylee and Jack had been dating for five years when she broke things off with him just three weeks before the murder. Is it Jack? Kaylee called Jack how many times that night? Before their final moments. Between 2.26 and 2.52 a.m., Kaylee called ex-boyfriend Jack seven times. Her best friend Maddie called him three times between 2.44 and 2.52 a.m. Why would you not text them back? Why would you not call them back? There was some footage going around of what appeared to be Kaylee Gonzalez and Madison Mogan hours before their murder at the Corner Club. They appear to be talking to an individual, and there's been a lot of speculation about who this individual is. Now, I took this photo, put it in Photoshop, super darkened it, did a little adjustment, just because I wanted to compare the hat to this. JD's profile photo. Just because he's in the corner club does not mean he killed the girls. I'm not accusing Jack of anything, but and I really, 
I am a, I'm a girl. I've been in those situations before where we've called our exes many, many times, you know, way back in the day. In a fluid situation with an unsolved crime, they're going, they're, people are going to point fingers to them. Don't take it personally. Don't people just generally care and they want to find out who did this. Or TikTok stars who have gone, you know, on social media and made clearly false statements. Online, there is no vetting mechanism. Nobody vets it. Nobody says, is that true? You have to question everything or you're not going to get down to the bottom line. It could have been this person. It could have been that person. It could have been whoever. No one is out of the question. People want to say, why would you question this person, that person? Well, the fucking police did, so why can't I? Citizen sleuths are focusing their attention on the... I feel like the big question we need to be asking is where the fuck are the roommates at? So the other two roommates were there at the time of the attack? Yes, they were. There were two surviving roommates in the home that night. A 911 call was not made until 11.56 a.m. So you have other roommates in the house when these four were murdered, and they didn't call the police to hours later? This is not adding up. There's something fishy about this case. We don't know why that call came in at noon and not um, in the middle of the night. They may have been passed out, um, and I'm not suggesting that they were. I'm just saying that the circumstances may have been that case. What if people were on DRUGS? We've all known that that house was a party house. It was known kind of as a party house. It was a known party house. We're only here for a noise complaint. Come to the damn door. Who lives here? Um, uh, we're not actually sure. Who lives here? Who's here? Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, students may have been involved in activities that maybe their parents weren't super excited about. Um, you know, they don't want to provide us information or tips because they're afraid that they might get in trouble. But not to call law enforcement for eight hours. I don't care how off your rockers you may be. It just, it's going to be hard to get away from that. And then them not releasing the 911 call, it, it makes us get, become a conspiracy theorist. Were they the 911 caller? I'm not going to divulge who our 911 caller is. Was the killer the 911 caller? I will tell you no. Why haven't they released the 911 call? At this point, what difference does it make? They've cleared the people that are involved in the 911 call, but yet they aren't releasing the information, so it must be valuable. The person that was inside the home that called 911 uh, that was not one of the roommates, can you conclusively rule that person out as a suspect at this point? I don't think I said that it wasn't one of the roommates. I said that uh, it was used with the um, roommate's phone. I, I believe it did. I kept going back to police and begging them for an explanation because it made no sense to me. And what I got from them was never a direct response, but more of, that's not the whole story. There is a side of the story that we're not being told yet about that morning. What happened the morning of November 13th still remains a mystery. In this video, I interview a mother who tells shocking info about that morning. Kim originally was speaking out on different platforms. Didn't I message her on Facebook? Do you remember, Mom? She was on Drunk Turkey Show. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kim. Hello, Kim. This Hello. is Daniel from the uh, Trump Turkey Show. <laughs> no. I think you called a couple of times, so I wanted to reach out. I did call a couple of times. I did call a couple of times. I just really feel it's important that there's so many other areas in this case that are just not um, being told, nor should they have to be. Her story was that her daughter had told her that before the first 911 call was made, there were some Snapchat groups, and in those Snapchat groups, there were conversations of what had happened in detail. So I thought that I would put her on my platform. Do you remember details about what was in the Snapchat group? I want to kind of dive in more into the I Snapchat. The details, yeah. yeah. So the details were the roommates were home, they were awake, aware, and had locked themselves in the downstairs bedroom. And then they called friends to come over. 
Locals are coming out claiming their kids or friends were at the home between 8 to 10 a.m. This user says that her nephew said a lot of people were at the home by 11. This is still one hour before the first 911 call. There was a ton of college-aged kids outside of the house when the police arrived. I don't know why there would be so many people there. You think that they were calling their friends like, come over and look at these dead bodies? You think that's what happened? If it is true that there were Snapchat groups and people knew about it so early, then why was 911 not called? I'm not against the surviving roommates, but it doesn't add up to me. What if the reason to call friends over first instead of 911 was in fact to contaminate the crime scene? What's the reason behind those eight hours of not calling the police? Why would the roommates not call police first? I think that very deep pockets are involved in this. I think it involves drugs, and I think it involves other trafficking situations in this area that are pretty rampant. She said basically that it was a drug house. They had drugs going in and out of there. There was some sort of drug relation. What I heard, and I'm not sure which of the girls said it, was they were getting rid of everything in the house. They were cleaning the house. I mean, to get rid of, um, you know, it's like, it doesn't take four hours. So yeah, it's like, so I don't know. They were coming up, I think they were coming up with the narrative. They're lying. They're, they are, they have created a narrative to protect something or somebody or themselves. After listening to Kim speak about what she knows about that morning, she appears to be telling the truth and appears to be sincere. What do you think? I listened to the entire thing, and as much as you want to say, this person's full of shit, maybe there's a little bit of, you know, meat in there. I don't buy it. I, don't, I think there'd be way more people than just one person telling that story. I can't corroborate her information. She would not be somebody that would be on my show. If any portion of that was wrong, I would literally have six months of hate behind it. Um, Olivia's been getting a decent amount of hate over this video. People thought she was lying. This WSU woman, like, I don't know why she just came forward or if she'd been came forward. I was getting tons of emails, almost threats. And it's like, okay, let me just take it down so that this goes away and I took it down. Do you guys know if Kim was a real person? Because someone's thinking that someone's pretending to be her. Because I saw a clip too where she was like, oh, someone's pretending to be me. So I don't know if that, there might be two, an impersonator and then her. Police are asking for the public's health, looking for occupants of a white Hyundai Elantra. The Elantra between 2011 and 2013. We're looking for that car because we believe that that car was in the area during the time of the murders. When they announced the Elantra, it was quite a frenzy at that time. People went insane. Police body cam footage picked this vehicle up driving down Tyler Avenue. Somebody seen it, somebody saw it riding down a road. It could have been a rental vehicle, it could have been a borrowed vehicle, it could have been hot. You couldn't drive a white Elantra in this, you know, month period of time without them being like, Meh, you're the one that did it. Must be that guy in the Elantra. Recently, a white Hyundai Elantra was found abandoned in Eugene, Oregon. I just don't think this car has anything to do with it. They have surveillance footage of that white car passing very, very fast. <gasps> ah! This is not the vehicle that we are looking for. <laughs> Here's the problem. There is no license plate. So far, we have a, a, a list of approximately 22,000 registered white Hyundai Elantras that fit into our uh, criteria that we're sorting through. And there's probably 100,000 white Hyundai Elantras throughout the country, okay? So, you know, you're talking about a needle in a haystack. Hey, maybe your neighbor has one in the garage that they don't drive very often, maybe. Uh... There was a vigil held last night in Boise, about 300 miles from the scene of the crime, but there's still no suspect, not even a murder weapon. 
What's the likelihood that the killer could be at the vigil? The public can be rest assured that we're aware of this potential and that we're working on it. I would like to start by saying my name is Stacy Chapin. I'm Ethan's mom. We are eternally grateful that we spent so much time with him. And I want to remind you that that's the most important message that we have for you and your families, because time is precious and it's something you can't get back. Santa, you will not be forgotten. You have impacted so many lives and have given people so much love. She taught me how to be a dad, and I didn't know that until she was gone, you know? My heart aches knowing I can't see her again in this lifetime. We'll find justice for you. We love you all so much. But these girls, they've been friends since sixth grade, and every day they did homework together, they came to our house together, they shared everything. Then they started looking at colleges, they came here together. They eventually get into the same apartment together. And in the end, they died together, in the same room, in the same bed. We still don't know much, and I think it's sad that the family stated that they know just as much as the public do, which is pretty much nothing. It is so, so difficult to be patient when you lose somebody. When do we stop with hiding all these things? I mean, there's nothing more painful to the family than just to sit around doing nothing. Steve Consalves was very involved early on. He did not believe enough was being done. He was really calling into question the investigation. He was clearly frustrated. Let's stop playing games, guys. I need somebody to step up and be an alpha. Be somebody to be a leader. Don't make me do it. I don't want to do it. He was very outspoken. And I don't think police wanted that. I think police wanted the victim's families to kind of hush down. And he was amplifying it. Steve shared that their family is currently raising funds in hope to have the public step forward with information. They would like to offer a reward and possibly hire a private investigator. And it's his right. He wanted answers. I called him America's dad. There were so many people wanting him to speculate at that time about who he thought might have done it. Is there anyone that that you have a weird feeling about? We weren't there for that. We were there to tell their story. What is your goal when you're going out there? Like, what, what do you have in your mind? You've got boots on ground, you're in a rental car. Like, what are you expecting? I think the goal is finding the information. The next goal is finding the interviews. We were driving down the road. It was snowing and I got an email, and the email said Gonzalez on it. My heart was like literally in my throat. And she's like, I think this is Steve. I think Steve just reached out to me. I was like shaking like, oh my gosh. The email was very simple, it was a couple words, and it was like, hey, let me know if you wanna talk. Gave him a call. And that was the beginning of my friendship with the Gonzalez family. What Steve says is that he was looking at who Kaylee was following on TikTok, and my name popped up, and he wanted to reach out to someone who Kaylee felt comfortable with. Because I have such a large platform, I can get the story exposure. My friend Bullhorn Betty and I had the honor of meeting the Gonzalez family. They welcomed us into their home. I hate having the day to death home there. They were doing everything the way that you tell your kid to go. They Ubered out together. They only went to known locations that they had been before. They traveled only together on well-lit, known streets to get food before taking a private ride from the same individual who would pick them up. Everything was perfect. Yeah. Everything was good. Yeah. All the way up to where they went to bed and went to sleep. Yeah. And that, I can't control. Now I want to touch a little bit on Jack, her boyfriend, because he's come under great scrutiny. He came here immediately. I asked him, did he have any scratches? Did he have any bruises? He can he's prove broken. that he had none. Can they? I want to see a photos everyone the police cleared. 
All of this that didn't have scratches. Mm -hmm. Because I have the photos of Jack. Mm -hmm. I've cleared him in my family. He's good with us.